God, you're so awesome. We just praise you. We worship you. We thank you for the opportunity to come here tonight to meet with the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. God, we come here to experience you tonight. God, we're not here by accident. We're not here to check off a box. We're not here to come and say we went to church. We're coming here. We're here tonight to meet with the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. So, Father, I pray that each one of us, each one of us tonight, each one of us will still our hearts and listen for that still small voice. God, we love you. We praise you. We worship you. We thank you, Father, that you allow us to worship you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Hey, go ahead and have a seat. Welcome, everybody. You guys seem kind of fired up tonight. Nice. So uh, I had some interesting moments this week. Um, I had some time where I had things that I was supposed to be writing and things I was supposed to be planning, and my mind just wouldn't settle down. And my mind was just reeling, and, and all the information that, that you're hearing, that we're hearing through social media or through the news or through friends, or it's just, it just became overwhelming. And as I was praying, I, I found myself in a position where I felt like I had to take a side. Has anyone else felt that way this week where I feel like I need to be on, on one side or the other? I have to choose one or the other. And as I'm praying, I'm saying, God, my spirit doesn't feel right. And I said, God, just reveal to me. And God said, listen, you're on my side. <laughs> You're on my side. You don't have to pick sides, Troy. You're on my side, and my side is always going to be love. My side is going to always be the vision statement of the church that I planted that you're pastoring, and that is that we will bring honor and glory to God by loving him and loving his people, period. Period. And so as I was, I was praying and thinking about it, God just just it just brought me to tears as God just walked me through what's beginning tonight that began about six years ago, seven years ago. My wife was walking through the mall, minding her own business, <laughs> and this very shy young lady got out of her comfort zone and hated every minute of walking up to my wife and saying, hey, I want to do an ambush on you and do your hair for free. Will you allow me to do that for you? And my wife was like, free? You bet. And if, I, if I'm right, that was the first and only time, right? That was free. <laughs> That's my girl. That a girl, Zanna. So Susanna ambushed Lena and did her hair. Out of all the people walking in the mall that day, she chose her. And then they became friends, and they were talking, and uh, my wife makes fun of me because she says I have a little ghetto in me sometimes, and she says, you got to meet my husband. Our husbands have to meet each other. I don't know what that's all about, but I was like, all right, honey, yeah. So we got together, and I met Tremaine, and it was an instant click. I mean, he and I were just laughing and joking, and uh, I think we started making fun of each other like in the first day we met, I think, and it's been nonstop ever since, and God showed me, so there was a divine appointment there. Uh, Tremaine later served as one of our youth leaders under in our youth group at Thrive. It did a great job um, relating to the kids in our community. Our youth group grew. Our friendship grew. And it was just a beautiful thing. So a few months ago, he and I were talking about, actually six months ago, he and I were talking and we said, hey man, you know, it's not okay that Sunday mornings are the most segregated day of the week. It's not okay. And, and we started talking and we said, hey, let's, let's get our churches and bring them together. And it's a brilliant, beautiful idea. And so we started talking and then I met with his father, Linnell, and him, and he bought me breakfast. Thank you. 
Me and Tremaine have been friends for seven years. I don't think he's bought me one meal in seven years. Oh, one. Oh, just the other day, because you knew I was going to say that. Right, right. So his dad buys me breakfast the first time I ever meet him, or the first time we hang out, so I'm a fan automatically, right? And so we said, hey, what would, what would happen if we took our two churches and we figured out a time to, to join services? We started calling it a joint service, and we thought it might attract the wrong people. <laughs> so we called it a combined service. He said, hey, what would happen if we did this? And I said, well, let's start. Let's start. Have you come and speak at our church? So Tremaine is here tonight. His father is going to speak next month. Bishop Linnell Bowden. I can't wait to, I'm going to introduce him as Bishop Linnell. I've always wanted to introduce him. I've never known a bishop that closely before. So I'm feeling pretty good about myself. In September, I'm going to go to their church and speak at their church. And then in October, we're planning on, we got to find a venue to do it. We're going to bring both congregations and anybody who wants to come. So I'm, I'm, looking, I'm looking at this progression, and God just made it so clear to me. He said, listen, <laughs> when it comes to love and racial relations, our government is clueless. So let's just be real. But let me have a shot. God said, said, let me show the world in Puyallup. We'll start there. Puyallup and Tacoma, and we'll move it out, and we'll show the world. And, you know, just maybe, maybe people who are sick and tired of being divided, maybe people will say, hey, you know what? Let's go see those churches and see what they're doing. And maybe we can start to make some ends in that. Because let me tell you this. I'll say it loud and proud and about, I get about 10 to 1 when I tell him I love him. I, he, like every 10 times I say it, he'll say it back one time. But that's okay. We're working on that. I love, I love him. I love Tremaine like he's my son. I love his wife like she's my daughter. These guys are special to me in my heart. And um, you know what? God is doing some stuff. And you know what? I'm just glad to be part of it. Are you guys glad to be part of it? All right. So no further ado, that was a great introduction, man. I hope you're going to bring the heat tonight. I want to introduce my friend, my brother, my every, he's just not my everything, that's my wife, but you know, my guy, Tremaine. Such an embracing hug. You knocked the mic off my ear. <laughs> Let's see if I can get this back on real quick. Well, wait for it. There you go. <laughs> I never had this problem. I don't have any dreads to worry about. Yeah. <laughs> I was thinking about rolling them, but no. <laughs> Lord God, we thank you for this day. We thank you for blessing each and every individual to be here today. We know not everybody made it through this week, but you have blessed us to make it here. And we give you praise and glory for that, Lord God. With each individual who has made it tonight, Lord God, we ask you to open up their hearts, open up their minds, open up their ears, Lord God. Open up their eyes to you so that they can see you, Lord God. Not me up here as your messenger, but hear your words, hear your truths, so that they can see what they need to apply to their lives, to grow and be the impacting change in their community. I ask you, Lord God, to just work through me, speak through me, use me as your vessel and your tool, so that I may, Lord God, deliver your message, and that you will receive glory in it all, and not me. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Okay, I want to first... Man, there's a lot of people in here. I like that. <laughs> I want to first start off by giving honor to my parents, Woo! Bishop Linnell Battle and Pastor Ina Battle, the pastors and uh, the head of Unity Christian Ministries, where church I was raised in. 
So I'm a product of their hard work and the body of Unity Christian Ministries. So I just want to give honor to them. Also give honor to the head of this church, Pastor Troy and Pastor Lena as well. And everybody else who came out, Pastor James, my cousin right there, came out, my brother and his family, my wife, of course, my beautiful wife. <laughs> And all the rest of you as well. I care about you all. Thank you for coming. <laughs> so, me and Troy, like Troy has said, he, uh, we have been talking over the last couple months, and we've definitely been really excited about this uh, unity in the community. Yeah. And it's really been something that's kind of just been put in the spotlight yeah. in this last week. Not just this last week, this last year, and the last couple of years. And so we see the impact of what that could do, not just in our community, but in our nation, how important it is for us to come together and show that we are all united. Amen. Amen. So we are definitely in the works for getting this. And this is kind of like the first step to that. Amen. Amen. Thank you for uh, all appreciating me being here and not just scolding me. <laughs> <laughs> One of the things we did talk about was uh, the series that we were going to come and speak during, me and my, my father. And he said, you guys kicked it off last week, reactions. Yeah. Oh, I love that topic. As soon as he brought it up to me, I was like, yes, reactions. I like this. I like talking about real things. I like talking about stuff that's down to earth. Because from what my understanding, correct me if I'm wrong, but my understanding was we're talking about biblical people in the real way how they reacted to real life situations, how they dealt with life. It sounds like that's exactly what this series is about. So that is exactly what I'm going to be speaking on. And I'm going to go with the topic of Jacob. Woo! Now, <laughs> I heard a couple woos, but <laughs> maybe we should uh, hold off on the woos until we see what we're talking about with Jacob. <laughs> Because we all know Jacob as the father of Israel. We know him as one of the patriarchs in the Bible. We know nothing but good things about Jacob when it comes first in our minds when we're talking about Jacob. But, you know, as it's properly titled, when we've made mistakes, reactions when we've made mistakes. And I put a little subtitle down there, Jacob, God's chosen cheater. Now, Jacob, being the father of Israel, we know that sooner or later he gets it together. Sooner or later he gets on the right path. But let's talk about his story, because I'm going to go through his story. I'm not going to read every scripture. I'm not going to read every verse, but I'm going to go ahead and paraphrase and go through his story. And we're going to pull out some of the points of how he reacted to life situations that he went through. We're going to start. You guys, who carries their Bible? You guys still carry your Bibles? Cell phones. <laughs> I'm talking about the written text right here. <laughs> there we go. That's what I like to see. Okay, we're going to start in Genesis chapter 25. Now, like I said, I'm going to paraphrase a lot of this just because his story is kind of, kind of long, but it's really going to impact you how you pay attention to some of the things that Jacob does, some of his, his habits, some of the ways that he reacts to life situations. To start it off, Jacob, know that Jacob was a twin. Jacob was the son of Isaac, who was Abraham's son, so Abraham's grandson, and he was a twin whose older brother was named Esau. Now, from the get-go, from the get-go, they were arguing and fighting in the womb. From the get-go, right out the gates, there was... Oh, man, something going on in my stomach. <laughs> All that going on right here in the womb. So there was issues and problems that he was dealing with before he even took his first breath. Now, when he, it came time for their birth, understand that Esau came out first. Now, Esau, we'll get into that a little bit more, but Esau came out like a manly man, came out hairy, came out, you know, he was first. He was the firstborn. He was the tough one. But right after he came out, you see this hand 
And I, I can only imagine the facial expression of Jacob because he's holding on to Esau's heel as he's coming out. <laughs> you can only imagine how his facial expression was that Jacob, Esau actually beat him out. Now, from there, then we get started with what's ever going on. Because Esau, like I said, grew up to be a manly man. He grew up to be a hunter. He grew up to be an outdoorsman. And so their father, Isaac, that's what he loved. He, he favored Esau. With Esau being the firstborn, that kind of added fuel to the fire. Now, Jacob, on the other hand, he was kind of a village boy. He was kind of the one who stayed back in the village and just cooked and, and cleaned and did the stuff that, you know, that was part of his personality. That was part of how God has made him. Now, Rebecca, his mother, favored Jacob. So those two principles would kind of play out into this first scenario of Jacob's life. Now, going into that, we'll see how Jacob deals with <clears throat> his first situation. Now, they, this is not teenagers, just to let you know. We're talking about Jacob in his young adulthood, okay? So we're not talking about kids making mistakes and give them a little pat on the hand. No, these are grown men making decisions, okay? Now, chapter 25 through 27 talks about some of the first situations that Esau, that the Bible deals with, with uh, Esau and Jacob. The first one was Esau comes in, and just to set this scenario, Esau comes in, and he's, he's tired. He's been hunting all day. He's been out in the sun. He's, he's tired. He's, he's famished. He's hungry. So he sees Jacob over here in the kitchen whipping it up. And I'm pretty sure Jacob's like, you smell that? Yeah, it smells good, huh? And so Esau comes in. Esau's like, oh, oh, that smells so good. Jacob, let me have some. And Jacob's like, ah, I don't know, man. I, I don't know if I can give this to you. Jacob's like, or Esau's like, I, I'm so hungry. I'm about to die. So Jacob says, well, won't you give me your birthright? Ooh, doesn't that seem weird? You're going to give up all your rights for a bowl of soup? <laughs> Esau doesn't take it at first. Esau's like, man, just give me some soup. Just give me some soup. Come on, man. I'm starving. I'm about to die. He's, Jacob says, hey, give me your birthright. Then Esau finally gives in and says, what good is a birthright if I'm dead? <laughs> give me some of that soup. You can have it. Jacob says, let's shake on it. Done deal. His birthright is gone. That's a big deal. That's a real big deal. Verse 34 of chapter 27. It says, Then Jacob gave Esau some bread and some lentil soup. He ate and drank and then got up and left. So Esau despised his birthright. He ate and drank and got up and left. Gave away his birthright. Bam. And Jacob is sitting there like, Ooh. <laughs> Got him. <laughs> Next situation. It comes down to the blessing. Now, this is very important because from here goes the patriarchs and all the genealogy of Jesus. They come from Jacob's genes. Amen. So understanding that, we see the next situation. Now, Isaac at this time was getting old. His eyes wasn't working too good. Those contacts just kept, couldn't stay in his eyes. I think the dust over there in the Middle East just kind of dried him out, so he couldn't really see that well. So he's laid up in his bed, right? And he sees Esau. Esau comes in his room, and he's having a conversation with Esau, and he's telling Esau, hey, you know, I'm not going to live much longer. Won't you go out and do what you do best, hunt something fresh, and prepare it how I like it and bring it back to me so that I can eat it, enjoy it, and then bless you. Give you your blessing. Yeah. Esau says, all right, goes, <laughs> gone. The whole time, their mother, Rebecca, is listening. She's listening. And she heard everything that was said. And as I said earlier, she favors Jacob. Yeah, yeah. And Jacob's the younger one. So he's not supposed to have any rights outside of the older brother. But she runs to him and says, hey, you got to get this blessing. Esau's about to get the blessing that your father is about to give, bestow upon him. You've got to get that. And Jacob's like, you know, he's the quiet village boy. I don't know. Uh, I don't think so. How am I going to do that? 
And from there, his mom starts to scheme, put these things together, make sure that this, this is going to happen. She says, I'm going to prepare this meal, your father's favorite meal, and you're going to take it in there to him. And he's like, well, I don't look like Esau, and I don't smell like Esau. She said, I'm going to grab his clothes and put it on you so you smell musty. <laughs> <laughs> And then I'm going to take the goat hair, and then we're going to spread it out on your arms and on your hands so you feel hairy like your brother. And you're going to go in there, and you're going to get that blessing. And Jacob said, I don't know, but okay. <laughs> but he goes in there, and he, there's a series of lies. Isaac is like doubtful, like, man, son, is that, you sound like Jacob, but you smell like Esau. <laughs> What's going on here? Why? What's, what, are you sure? Yes, it's me, Father. He directly lied to his father. But Isaac fell for it. Isaac ended up blessing Jacob. He ended up giving Jacob the blessing. Now, from there, from there, Jacob leaves. Jacob's like, okay, it's done. The deed is done. Esau comes in, finds out, what? What do you mean? Isn't there a blessing left for me? Isn't there something left for me? And his father was like, yeah, there's a blessing left for you. You will serve your brother. Understand that that was a big deal to Esau. Esau was upset. So he said, I'm going to kill Jacob. Found out about that. And Jacob had to leave. But that goes to my first point. And my first point is, cheaters can prosper. Hmm. We're talking about reactions that real people had in the Bible. Not fake people, not people who are holy above holy, not people that just seem like they do every single thing right. No. We're talking about real people, real reactions. You see, one of the things to understand about Jacob is he swindled his way in to getting his, that birthright. He swindled and lied and cheated his way to get the blessing. How is that even possible? How is that even, how is that even an option? Very good point. <laughs> Start paying me overtime for this. <laughs> Dang, I don't know why that's still on there. Probably these beautiful hair. <laughs> Got a staple gun? <laughs> you guys gotta understand, I'm kinda spoiled. My wife is a hairstylist and she's a fantastic hairstylist. So every single time there's something wrong with my hair, I just go, please. <laughs> but cheaters can prosper, and this is a big issue. Because when we take a look at how we react in life, how many in here has cheated at something? Man, let me see. Man, I ain't ever playing no games with y'all. <laughs> my, my. <laughs> how many in here has lied? What was your reaction after you did it? Ooh, very good question. How did you react after you lied? I use myself for an example. I remember cheating on test. And if I got a good grade, I said, yes! <laughs> Woo! Doing it again! <laughs> Jacob kind of did the same thing. After he swindled Esau out of his birthright, it was easy for him to go along with Rebecca with the scheme to go ahead and get the blessing. He did not react properly. And so we seen that he, he was a cheater and he prospered. He had a little bit of growth in his life just from cheating. But he didn't respond in the right way. That's why I said cheaters can pro prosper for a while. The question, though, is, is this. Why would God allow Jacob to cheat Esau out of his birthright and then his blessing? There's two reasons I want to break that down. 
the first reason is, let's just focus on Esau and who Esau was. Esau, <laughs> he was a manly man. He was stubborn. He was a hothead. He was the one that you did not want to cross paths with when it came down to getting in any fights or any kind of discussions or any kind of problems. Esau was the man. But you got to also understand that Esau, he went out and married two women, so two Hittite women, and they were nothing but grief to his parents. They were nothing but problems to his parents. So Esau wasn't living out the life that his parents will bless any kind of descendants that he would have. That's the first point. You see, you also got to understand the second point is why God would allow these things to happen, these cheaters to get their way. We got to understand that God has a plan. It doesn't always look like God has a plan. It doesn't always look like everything's working out for the best. It doesn't always look like things are going good and it is going to happen. Sometimes it looks like it's just all despair, no hope. Sometimes it looks like that. But we got to understand, first of all, God has a plan. If you have your Bibles, look at verse, the end of verse 23 on chapter 25 of Genesis. It says, this is what, after they were fighting in the womb, Rebecca went to go see, you know, what, what's the problem? What, what is the problem? So she prayed, and God answered her, and this is what God said to her. The Lord said to her, two nations are in your womb, and two people from within you will be separated. One people will be stronger than the other. The older will serve the younger. Hmm. Doesn't that seem like God is, has a plan for their situation between Esau and Jacob? God has a plan. There's one thing I kind of want to touch on because, yeah, like we've all, like uh, some of us who've been up in front of you guys have said, we've been going through some turmoil in our, our nation. You know, some racial issues, killings, murders, and there's a lot of pain, a lot of death going on right now. Understanding that God has a plan, but also understand that God's plan involves us. And I'm sorry to tell you, but we're flawed. We have our issues. We have our problems. We are not perfect. We come with pain already inside, and a lot of times we bring that pain to other people. So even though God is perfect, and even though God has a perfect plan, what happens is we make the pain in that plan. We bring the turmoil. Now, remember I said at the end of that first point is, for a while. That's important because we need to understand that every decision has a result. Every choice has an effect. Everything that we do, it will play out. Amen? So we'll continue with Jacob's story. Now, Jacob found out that his brother was upset with him. That's to say the least. And since he was upset with him, he wanted to kill him. And, of course, him being a mama's boy, I know I haven't said that yet, but he's a mama's boy. His mom comes to him and is like, you've got to leave. You've got to go. Won't you go back to my hometown? You go back to my hometown, link up with my brother, and stay there for a while until all this stuff blows over. And of course, he's kind of reluctant. He's a village boy. He don't want to go on any adventures on his own. So he's like, oh, okay, okay. So Rebecca talks to Isaac. Isaac blesses him to go. He says, I don't want you marrying any of these Canaanites. So won't you go out and Go back to your mother's hometown and live. So he goes. And here is a very, very important point. While he's out there, in chapter 28 is the pivotal point in Jacob's life. Jacob's out in the desert on a path to his mother's hometown. And he lays down for the night and he has a dream. Now this dream Pretty much everything after this point always goes back to this dream that he had. Always goes back to when God spoke to him through this dream. All his decisions that he made from here on out refer back to this dream. Genesis chapter 28, verse 12. 
He had a dream in which he saw a stairway resting on the earth with, it, with its top reaching to heaven, and uh, angels of God were ascending and descending on it. There above it stood the Lord, and he said, I am the Lord, the God of your father Abraham and the God of Isaac. I will give you your decision. I will give you and your descendants the land on which you are lying. Your descendants will, like, will be like the dust of the earth, and you will spread out to the west and to the east, to the north and to the south. All peoples on earth will be blessed through you and your offspring. I am with you, and I will watch over you wherever you go. I will bring you back to this land. I will not leave you until I have done what I have promised you. Very important, very important, because we're talking about a cheater right now. We're talking about Jacob, and Jacob is a cheater. Jacob is a liar. Jacob is the one that you do not want to have anything to do with because he will hustle you out of everything. <laughs> now, seeing that he is that person, listen to his response. Later on in that chapter, verse 20. Then Jacob made a vow saying, if God will be with me and will watch over me on this journey I am taking and will give me food to eat, clothes to wear, <clears throat> so that I return safely to my father's house, then the Lord will be my God. And this stone that I have set up as a pillar will be God's house. And of all that you give me, I will give you a tenth. Message for another day, but that's where the tenth came from, <laughs> for our tithes and our offering, okay, <laughs> for our tithes. I mean. So that was the pivotal point in Jacob's life. From there, Jacob goes on to his mother's homeland, and he ends up running into his cousin, which is this, we won't talk about all that kind of stuff, but he ends up going to his cousin, Rachel, and he falls in love with her, falls in love with her. Then he finds out that that is his cousin, which didn't stop him, but he finds out that is his cousin. So he runs to uh, his uncle, Levin, and from there, he strikes up an agreement with him. Now, understand, choices have repercussions. If he didn't cheat Esau, he wouldn't be in this situation, correct? Now, he goes and strikes a deal with Levin. Now, Levin, <laughs> oh, you thought Jacob was a cold hustler. <laughs> Levin, on the other hand, whew, he takes the cake. He says to, they strike up the deal, and this is the deal. Levin has two daughters, Leah and Rachel. Leah's the older one, Rachel's the younger one. And, Le and the deal was, if Jacob works for Levin for seven years, he would get Rachel's hand in marriage. Now, the point of that is, seven years is a long time. <laughs> to work for somebody's hand in marriage. Uh -huh. He was dedicated. Yeah. <laughs> so he works those seven years. And it says, it says that those seven years didn't even seem like a year. It seemed like a couple days. He was so in love with Rachel. <laughs> and then at the end of that seven years, you know what Levin does? He sends, sneakily sends his daughter Leah into there and Mary, ends up marrying Leah without, him, without Jacob even knowing and so, of course, Jacob gets up like, who are you? <laughs> and from there, from there, he runs up to Levin like, what, 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 what is this? What is this? I want that, and you gave me this. What happened, man? What about our agreement? And Levin's like, no, 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 it's custom around here that the older sister gets married first. So if you want the, the younger daughter, you're going to have to work another seven years. Oh. And my man Jacob's a soldier for that. Because he said, I. Right. <laughs> so he goes for another seven years. Another seven years. And he finally gets Rachel's hand in marriage. But that, he does, that wasn't the end of their relationship. He actually stayed for another six years and worked for Levin. He was with Levin for 20 years. 20 years. The problem was, is Levin was a cold hustler. <laughs> and Levin changed his wages 10 times. Just changing it, like, wait, I thought we had an agreement. Give it, 
take it or leave it, what? This is what it is. It's like, man, I just did all this work for seven years, 20 years, and you're changing my wages. And so through all, all that, God ended up still blessing Jacob. Jacob had to go through 20 years of hardship, 20 years of pretty much serving his own family member and getting treated wrong. 20 years of that. But then God finally said something to him. God finally said, then the Lord said, Genesis chapter 31, verse 3, then the Lord said to Jacob, go back to the land of your father and to, the rel and to your relatives and I will be with you. He got a command. Go back home. Go. And you know what Jacob did? Jacob went. That brings me to my second point. When God speaks, you do. When God speaks, you do. You see, even though Jacob accumulated all this wealth, because throughout the time that he was in the homeland of his mother, that's when he had all his kids. And his kids are the 12 tribes of Israel. You know, they're throughout the rest of the Bible. A lot of bad stories about them, too. But <laughs> that's where his start came. That's where he received his wealth. That's where he had his start. But when God told him, it's time for you to go home, it's time for you to go home. When is God speaking to you? No matter what's going on in your life, when is God speaking to you and telling you to do something? And then what do you do? Do you just do it? Those two simple words, do you just do it? <laughs> Let's understand something, though. We are talking about God's chosen cheater. Now, with God's chosen cheater, you got to understand something. He don't just do stuff that's holy above holy. Nah, he does it in the uh, <laughs> deceitful way. You see, when he left, he did do what God told him to do. And you know what's important about that? It's the end of that verse where it says, and I will be with you. He knew God would be with him. Because he had that meeting and that dream when he was out there sleeping. He knew God would be with him. But we're talking about reactions, right? What do you do when life circumstances come to you? How do you react to it? Well, we'll see how Jacob react to it. When Jacob heard that God told him to leave, Jacob didn't go like uh, Moses. Ah, there we go. Jacob didn't go out there like Moses and say, let my people go. <laughs> no, no. Jacob said, you want me to go? <laughs> <laughs> Jacob just snuck off. Jacob still had that deceitful mentality. Jacob was that person who was God's chosen cheater. Let's understand, he did what he was supposed to do in leaving, but how he did it. Let that be an important point to all of us. Understand, you can be obedient to God and do what he tells you to do, but are you doing that the right way? You can tell somebody what they need to hear, but are you telling them in the right way? You can give to people and you can help them out, but are you giving it with the right heart? We need to understand reactions and how we learn from our reactions and these biblical individuals' reactions. These are God's people. These, this, is, this is what we're supposed to learn from. And this person right here, learn not to be a cheater. Let's keep it going. <laughs> Let's keep it going. So, Levin catches up with, with, uh, with Jacob. And in, in verse 26 of chapter 31, it starts to break down how Jacob left. He said, Laban's like, man, you deceived me. You just left while I was out and about. You just left. You took all my grandkids. You took my daughters. You took everything, and you just left. You didn't even say goodbye. And Jacob was like, yeah, God, 
God told me to go. <laughs> so I left. <laughs> Knowing that he left in a deceitful way. But the whole situation, God ended up telling him. God ended up telling Levin. Verse 28, it says, you have done a foolish thing. Right at the end, it says, you didn't even let me kiss my grandkids, my daughters, goodbye. You have done a foolish thing. But verse 29, it says, I have the power to harm you. But last night, the God of your father said to me, be careful not to say anything to Jacob, either good or bad. God took care of him. God took care of him. God will take care of you when you are obedient to him. God will take care of you. But if you do what God wants you to do in the right way, we have our flaws. We have the way that we do things that's not always the perfect way. But when we do things God's perfect way, we don't get Levin chasing us. We don't get that one trying to pursue us and take us out. No, we leave them blessed and we move on to bless the next. So the situation ends up working out because Levin ended up fearing God and knew that it was true. So they, they actually make a covenant together not to attack each other. Levin goes back home, and Jacob proceeds to go back to his, uh, his father's house. Now on the way, his, his head is ticking. He's thinking, he's thinking, wait a minute, I'm about to run back into Esau. <laughs> I'm about to meet back up with my older brother. The savage. And so as he's thinking all this, remember who we're talking about. We're talking about Jacob, the cheater. So what is he doing? He's thinking, he's thinking, he's trying to figure this out. He's trying to say, oh, man, what, what can I do to make this situation better for me? What can I do to fix this? How can I fix this? His idea was to give Esau some gifts, send them up in front of him. While he waits back, go, go, go. And wait and see how Esau responds. Esau responds with, I'm coming. And Jacob says, what? <laughs> you coming? No, nah, let, let me come to you. You know, did you like the gifts? Let me come to you. But Esau's already on his way. So Esau, or I mean Jacob, does not end up meeting him. He goes a different way. And from there, a very pivotal point in his life, at this point, Jacob ends up wrestling with God, physically wrestling with God. Now, this, this, this verse kind of confuses me because, honestly, this verse kind of confuses me. This is chapter 32 of Genesis, where he wrestles with God. Wrestling with God? <laughs> wrestling with God? Physically? And then, this is the verse that really surprises me as it says, so Jacob was left alone, and a man wrestled with him until daybreak. When the man saw that he could not overpower him, he touched the socket of, his, of Jacob's hip so that his hip was wrenched as he wrestled with the man. Then the man said, let me go, for it is daybreak. But Jacob replied, I will not let you go unless you bless me. Oh. <laughs> wow. You wrestling with God, and you going to say that to him? He said, bloop. <laughs> and you going to say, I ain't letting you go until you bless me? That's a pivotal point in his life. Because he showed enough faith in God that he was relentless not to give up. That brings me to my last point. Be honest. Be honest with yourself. Be real with yourself. Don't give up. Don't just let it go. Be real. Be motivated. You see, Jacob knew he was in a problem. He knew he was going to meet his brother, and he didn't have a clue what that meeting was going to be like. And so when he had an opportunity to have an interaction with God, he didn't let go. He held tight to him. He said, I will not let go of you until you bless me. I know that you are my rock and my salvation. I know that you are everything to me. And without you, I only see failure. <laughs> so Jacob seen that. And the reality of his choices was, this is my only choice. It didn't matter that his hip was popped out. That didn't matter. 
It didn't matter everything that he went through. All that didn't matter. He knew that this was his only hope. Let's ask ourselves that. When we're faced, when we're face to face with the thing that scares us the most, when we're dealing with the thing that we are so helpless to control, what do we do? Do we send gifts out there to try to deceive and and distract and change the situation? Or do we cling to God, the only one who can control it? Are we honest with ourselves to know that we have no control? We have no control. Do we see that our God is the almighty and the powerful one? I can say for myself, I would like to give my testimony from this last weekend, 4th of July weekend, perfect example where I had to be honest with myself. I had to be honest with where I was in the situation that I was in. Me and my family went camping in eastern Washington. And we went out on this lake, and we had a good time. We went to the other side of the lake, and there was this nice beach area where we all just laid down and went to sleep, did some exploring, did some hiking. It was just a good time with the family. And so we got over there through my boat. I had a nice little 14-foot boat. It's like, yeah, it's nothing. Let's go. And as I take them back, the wind was kind of choppy, but as I take the first crew back, we dock, we get, they get the off and everything, And as I get ready to go back to get the last of them, my wife, my son, my brother, my two cousins, and my nephew, the wind picks up. And the wind picks up like no other. To the point where it was picking up the boat and just throwing me around. I saw no hope in the situation. I saw all I could do was cry out and cling to my God. I seen I had nothing else. I had to be honest with myself. Because when I went out there, when I went back, I said, I'll just give it more gas and I'll I'll fly. I'll just just do this. I'll turn to the side. Or when the wave comes, I'll just block it and counter the wave. I'll do this. I'll do that. But I couldn't. I was out there in the thick of it. And I almost lost my life on Sunday. The boat comes crashing to the side, hitting big rocks. I jump out, barely had my life jacket on, jump out, grab the boat, trying to wrestle it in. Water just coming over the sides, just filling up. I'm manhandling this boat, trying to screaming to the top of my lungs because I'm by myself. Everybody else is half mile over there, Half mile over there, I'm by myself screaming out to God, God, help me. Somebody help me. And at that point, that's when I knew I had to be honest with myself. Without him, I'm nothing. Without him, I have nothing. Let's understand, because to finish up the story, Jacob reunites with his brother, and all is well. Jacob reunites with his brother, and everything is good. His brother tries to give him gifts. Jacob reunites with his brother, and from there, they part ways, and then all the good stuff happens for Jacob when he's, you know, Israel, the father of Israel, because after After, I didn't say this, but after he wrestled with God, that's when God changed his name to Israel. I want everybody just to close their eyes. Stop looking at me. (laughs) And think about your reactions in life.
You see, we have a lot of situations going on in our nation. With the presidency, politics, with the, with the economy, with all the mass shootings, the police deaths, all of that. How is your reactions to that? How do you react to that? How do you see yourself playing out in these situations? I want to challenge each and every last one of you, including myself, to react in a way that your God is telling you to react. Not to reside on your own thoughts and your own legitimate logic and rationality. No. Listen to what your God says. What your God says about all these issues that man has an opinion on. What does your God say about it? And I pray that we all remember that our reactions is a reflection of who we love. So let us strive to please our God. Let us strive to fulfill our purpose. Lord God, we thank you for this day. We thank you for this day. This day was not promised to us. I said this day was not promised to us. I thank you for this day. I ask you, Lord God, to just bless my reactions through my life and death situation, that I react to going and leaning and striving to you, that I won't think that I could fix it all, that I won't think that I have the solution, that I won't think that I have it all figured out, but I just run to you and that you embrace me in your arms and I hug you back tight as I can. And that I will learn to acknowledge you in all my ways so that you can make my path straight. So that I can know what it is I'm supposed to do. And I pray for the congregation that this message just won't reside here but that it will go out to the community and it will affect the world around us. In your name, Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen.